G'day, I'm Gary Stevens, and welcome to the third season of the History in the Bible podcast. In this final season, I explore how the Jews and the Christians constructed new religions when they were sent spinning into the void after the destruction of the temple. All of the history about all of the books beyond the Bible. Episode 3.28 The Last Heirs of Abraham, Part 2 Fall of the Temple In the last episode, I set the stage for the final act in the great drama that was Second Temple Judaism. The Romans have now lumbered into the theatre and installed Herod the Great as star of the show. The Romans esteemed Judaism as a bona fide religion one just as worthy of esteem as many other religions in the empire. They respected Judaism's ancient roots. The Judeans enjoyed special protections and privileges, especially in their homeland. They were exempt from military service and from performing the pagan state demonstrations of loyalty they found so offensive. They also had special permission to meet in synagogues, Now, that was a really big deal. The Roman state was deeply suspicious of private meetings. One emperor had even dissolved the Roman fire brigades, lest they become hotbeds of sedition. As far as we can tell, some pagans thought the Jews were rather unsocial. But that's about it. In return... Most Jews thought that any religion other than their own was rubbish. We know that in the Hellenistic period, not only did Jews accept converts, they actively sought them. The Jews seemed to have ceased proselytizing by Roman times, but had no problem with converts. Some pagans admired Judaism enough to found and fund some of the new synagogues that were popping up all over the place. On the other hand, we have ample evidence that wherever Greeks and Judeans cohabited in a town, trouble was, alas, not far away. They simply did not get on. The Greeks even had a specific term for their incessant squabbling, stasis. In ancient Greek, stasis refers to violent political dissension or insurrection within a body politic. Greek cities before the Roman period were infamous for their ongoing stasis between warring factions. The Greeks were no strangers to internecine political violence. Neither were the Judeans. The years of the Maccabean kings, through to Herod the Great, saw many violent political eruptions. So began the conflict between what the Greeks called Hellenismos and Judaismos between Greek culture and Jewish culture. That would come to a fatal boiling point in the Kittos War. For more details on that horror, hearken back to episode 3.15, Tumultus Judeorum. The real difficulty that Jews had with the Greek and Roman social system was, well, social. The empire was founded on a structure of patron-client relationships. Patrons were the small number of wealthy who could dispense favours to their many poorer clients. In return, the clients would vote for them at local elections. Yes, the Romans had lots of little elections. They weren't a complete autocracy. They would bring presents on birthdays and at marriages, provide muscle in times of trouble, and help rearrange the furniture. These relationships brought honour to all parties. Jews thought that all honour belonged to God. God was the one and only patron. So they declined to participate in the most important and most pervasive social structures in the empire. If the relationship between the Jews and pagans and the Judean state and the imperial power was not cosy, it was tolerable. The century-long concordat between Rome and the dynasty of Herod was irretrievably shattered in 66 CE. 
all the ethnicities in the area, Syrians, Judeans, Greeks, Idumeans, Nabataeans, Samaritans, were keen to maintain their rights and security against the others. All dreaded ethnic violence, and all looked to Rome to defend them. By establishing their provincial capital at Jerusalem, the Romans assured the Jews that the imperial power had their back. Since the time that the Romans had marched down the coast, the Judeans had embraced their role as policemen for the Romans, and savoured Jerusalem as the Roman seat of power. Rome was their protector, not their oppressor. Judean opinion changed after Rome moved its headquarters from the Judean city of Jerusalem to the Greek city of Caesarea Maritima on the Mediterranean coast in Samaria. The Romans enlisted Greeks, Arabs and Samaritans as auxiliaries to maintain the peace. The Judeans panicked. They were suddenly confronted with their worst nightmare. Rome had previously protected them from their local enemies. Now a Roman procurator was using those same enemies to police them. Many factions felt they had no option but radical protest. Not against the oppression of an imperial power, but against the failure of that power to defend them against their ancient regional enemies. And so began the Great Revolt of 66. The revolt was just as much a civil war as a rebellion against Rome. The evidence we have is that the spiteful Judean warlords killed almost as many of their fellow Jews as the Romans did. By the year 70, when all the blood had trickled into the sand, Jerusalem had been sacked and the temple lay in ruins. Some professors emphasise Roman moderation after the revolt. Yes, Rome showed as much mercy to the Judean rebels as it did to any other rebels. None. Still, they had no intention of punishing the Jews of the diaspora. Jews everywhere were still free to worship their god as they always had. They were allowed to live and work in Palestine and the wreck that was Jerusalem. The Jewish inhabitants of Roman cities retained all the privileges that Rome had granted them for centuries. Other scholars are much less charitable. They hold the Greek communities took advantage of imperial displeasure, a disapproval that encouraged hostility to those in the diaspora. Provincial governors began to favour Greeks in court cases against Judean opponents. Where before the Great Revolt, courts had punished rioters of any stripe, now they excused Greek attacks on Jews. For the Jews living in Judea, the destruction of the capital and the temple was devastating. The rituals of the year, of their festivals and temple sacrifices, were shattered. The power of the temple political hierarchy was broken forever. Almost all the inheritors of Abraham vanished. The priests and Levites were lost to history. The Pharisees and Sadducees disappeared as organised factions. Only two remained. One of these was the emerging rabbinic movement. The other was the nascent Christian community. They were the last heirs of Abraham. Until 40 years ago, scholars followed the lead of the great Lord Digest the Mishnah. They accepted without question that the rabbis adroitly stepped into the power vacuum and took upon themselves the social and intellectual leadership of the Jewish people. You can reacquaint yourself with the Mishnah with episode 3.17, Quest for the Rabbis, Part 2, Mishnah. Most modern scholars now believe that the rabbis played a very small part in Jewish society until well after the year 200. If anyone filled leadership roles after the Great Revolt, it was the remnants of the priesthood, not the rabbis. Inscriptions and papyri that we have from diaspora Jewish communities rarely reflect rabbinic ideas or practices. 
inscriptions in Roman synagogues hardly ever refer to rabbis. Many Roman funerary inscriptions from the period proudly describe the deceased as a priest. Very few mention a rabbi. And even then, we cannot know if that is a rabbi in the Mishnaic sense or a rabbi in the ancient general sense of a teacher. At the time of the destruction of the temple, Christianity consisted of two communities of Jesus clubs. These communities were very young. After all, Jesus had died only a generation earlier, and Paul and Peter ten years before. They were very loose networks, knit by visits from travelling preachers and letters. One community was comprised of pagan fans, converted by people like Paul. The other community was composed of Jews, who viewed Jesus at least as the great reformer of their religion, if not a messiah. The latter looked to the Jerusalem club for leadership. Now, one interesting issue is the place of Hellenized Jews in these two fractions of the church. Which community did they prefer? Well, we don't know. The Christians galloped off with ideas from the vast apocalyptic literature floating around. From this literature, they understood that evil was brought to the world by cosmic forces opposed to God. These would one day engage in a war with the forces of good. A war fought in both heaven and earth. A new world order would be forged from God's triumph. Most of the key concepts of Christianity were drifting around the second temple zeitgeist. An axis of light against dark, good against evil, check. An end to time when God installs himself as the world's ruler, Check. Eternal oblivion to sinners and eternal life to the righteous. Check. A personage sent by God to bring all this about, a Messiah. Check. As Professor Donald Akinson of Queen's University in Canada points out, most of Jesus' biography was written before he was born. You could even argue that the specific person that the Christians put at centre stage was nowhere near as important as the symbols and motifs constructed around that person. The Christians campaigned for Jesus, but it could just as easily have been John the Baptist, or or someone whose name has been entirely lost to us. And indeed, some groups, such as the Mandaeans, did settle on the Baptist. The apocalyptic books ignored the covenant made between the people and God at Sinai and had no interest in making new laws for the people. These books also rejected the temple. And so Christians rejected the temple as a model for heaven. They decided that the divine realm was more like a Hellenistic king surrounded by angelic courtiers. And his court was one that any good Christian could join after death. One very important concept the Christians took from the Jews was their idea of a one true religion. Classical paganism was diverse and inclusive. If you worshipped Zeus, nothing stopped you from also attending sacrifices for Athena. No one was converted from worshipping Zeus to worshipping Athena. You could do both. Both Judaism and Christianity were exclusive. They insisted that anyone who worshipped their god was forbidden from worshipping any other god. Now, Roman pagans simply could not understand that attitude. Now, here is a modern analogy. In our world, you can belong to as many film star fan clubs as you like. You are permitted to love George Clooney, Dame Judi Dench and Audrey Tattoo all at the same time. That's how classical paganism worked. It made no sense for Romans and Greeks to say you have to choose. Judaism and Christianity said, if you join our George Clooney fan club, you are forbidden from joining any other club. For a time, Jews and Christians squabbled as to which group had the real George Clooney fan club. Eventually, they founded two rival Clooney clubs. 
there was a difference between the two religions. To continue the analogy, the Jews made no demands that others join their Clooney fan club. To the contrary, George Clooney was just for them. George himself chose the members of the fan club, and that was that. The Christians eventually went a step further. In the late 380s, they demanded that everyone must join their George Clooney fan club. Those who failed to see Clooney's magnificence were not simply ignorant or misguided. They were under the sway of cosmic powers of evil. And we can't have that, can we? Another concept the Christians took from Judaism was that of charity. A voluntary giving to those less well-off. Few people in the Roman Empire lived above a subsistence level. Almost 80 in 100 were farmers, leading lives determined by the vicissitudes of luck, weather and local grain prices. If they were fortunate, they produced more than they needed to feed themselves and could sell the surplus in the market towns. Of the 10 in 100 who lived without fear of starvation, half made their way through life without daily want, but had little to spend on luxuries. The remaining ten were the wealthy. Merchants and artisans, old nobility, and political elites who could splash out. And one in a thousand was very comfortable indeed. No one in antiquity had the least thing to say about this economic structure. No Roman and no Greek philosopher argued that the rich should help those less fortunate. The idea was inconceivable. The intellectuals of antiquity did have advice for the wealthy, but not the sort you might expect. The philosophers argued that riches corrupted the morals and integrity of the wealthy. The rich should indeed spend their money, but not on the poor. Why on earth would you do that? No, the rich must adorn their cities. They must fund temples and marketplaces and baths and public spectacles like gladiator shows. That's the way to spend money. And you get your name engraved on a building. Unique in the ancient world, Judaism had a long tradition of charity to the needy, going back to the earliest books. Quote, Deuteronomy 15.10 Give readily and have no regrets when you do so. For in return, Yahweh will bless you in all your efforts and in all your undertakings. For there will never cease to be needy ones in your land, which is why I command you, open your hand to the poor and the needy kin in your land. The prophets rammed home the message. Here is my favourite prophet, Amos. Quote, Amos 4.1 Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, on the hill of Samaria, who defraud the poor, who rob the needy, who say to your husbands, bring and let's carouse. My Lord God swears by his holiness. Behold, days are coming upon you, when you will be carried off in baskets, and to the last one, in fish baskets, and taken out of the city. End quote. The Christians followed suit. Quote, Acts 1.32 Now the company of those who believed were one of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had everything in common. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and a distribution was made to each as any had need. End quote. You don't find that passage quoted too often these days, do you? In the next episode, I conclude my sad story of the winnowing of the heirs of Abraham. Thanks for visiting. For show notes, maps, charts, and timelines, visit my website at www.historyinthebible.com. You can even download professional posters for free.